Hey, it's Mike here, and today, as a result of a surprising amount of requests from you guys, I'm gonna talk about Professor Tim Noakes, who is a South African low-carb diet advocate who somewhat recently got in some hot water for recommending that a woman wean her baby off of breast milk onto a low-carb diet. Well, I think his intentions are generally good. I do not think his information is. It appears that he takes small benefits of a low-carb diet and then extrapolates that to the entire health states of all people on low-carb diets. And he uses industry-funded study to do that and completely ignores all of this study showing the negative effects in terms of mortality and artery function and so forth. So we're gonna look at all of his claims and put them up against the science. Let's go. Now, if you're from the Northern Hemisphere, like most of my viewers, you probably have no idea who Tim Noakes is. He is quite famous, however, in the Southern Hemisphere, in areas like South Africa and Australia, and he is a professor emeritus of exercise science, and as he describes himself on his own Twitter, quote, author, emeritus professor, runner, low carbohydrate diet proponent, spreading scientific information, not medical advice, no longer a medical practitioner. Now he does have an MD and he does have some best-selling books down under and it's no surprise because he's telling people that they should be eating more animal fat, more meat, more eggs, etc. Now if you hear him talk and you're from where I am, you'll be a little thrown off about how he refers to a low-carb diet as a Banting diet and that's from Dr. Banting who used a low-carb diet who is sort of their cultural equivalent to Dr. Atkins. And total side tangent that I apologize for, but Prof Noakes kind of reminds me of Prof Oak from the old Game Boy Pokemon games. And they're kind of similar because Prof Oak was telling you to go out and catch a bunch of little animals and put them in a little cube and then force them to fight each other. And Professor Noakes is telling you to eat more animals, exploit more animals, basically the same person. Now let's look at some of his ideas. The first one that threw up a red flag for me is that he wants you to doubt the scientific consensus. Now what does the WHO, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Mayo Clinic, the Harvard School of Public Health, and the European Society of Cardiology all have in common? Well, they support this premise from the European Heart Journal, quote, there are strong, consistent, and graded relationships between saturated fat intake, blood cholesterol levels, and the mass occurrence of cardiovascular disease. The relationships are accepted as causal. Scientists do not throw out the C word very often. But from Noakes, here you go. These are consensus guidelines, and you must never trust consensus guidelines because they are anti-science. Science is not about consensus. It's about disproof and disbelief and skepticism. It's not about consensus. When you have consensus, you've got trouble. Now, really quick, he's sort of putting forth a reverse appeal to authority fallacy, that fallacy being that just because it comes from an authority or because it's an authority means that it is correct. He's taking that to the opposite degree and saying that because it's an authority, in this case, consensus, that it is wrong. Fallacy. Neither case is true, but consensus is definitely not wrong by default. Simple example, the general consensus is that we are human. Just because it's a consensus doesn't mean we're not human and we're actually lions or something, although I bet a lot of these meat eaters would like to believe that. Anyway, the whole point of this is so that he can turn you against the medical consensus and put forth ideas like how saturated fat is not bad for you. Very fringe. Very briefly through, the dietary animal saturated fat causes heart disease. Actually, there's no definitive evidence that dietary fat causes any disease at all, no, and heart disease. If you fear fat, if you fear saturated fat, it's because the actions of the vegetable food lobby in the United States government. You just have to follow the money. That's all you have to do to understand it. So we must be using studies that aren't linked to industry, right? He has the first study showing no significant evidence for concluding dietary saturated fat is associated with increased risk of coronary heart disease. And it was written by Dr. Krauss, and Dr. Krauss is a crucial player in this whole thing. He's all, Dr. Krauss is so great. No, actually Dr. Krauss has spent much of his career working for the dairy industry. Astoundingly, the exact study that Noakes mentioned was funded directly by the dairy industry. You just have to follow the money. And since the main source of saturated fat in the US diet is dairy, they wanna make sure they dissipate any fears about that so people keep buying dairy products. And so the theory is this, that you eat the fat and you get your clogged arteries and your arteries clog and then you have a heart attack and you drop dead, boof. And what I want to make the point that not one of these components has ever been proven. 
Nope, in reality, we have rigorous science like this study, which is a meta-analysis on hundreds of metabolic ward studies showing that as they feed people more saturated fat, their cholesterol level goes up. And for the cholesterol heart disease connection, you can watch my cholesterol video, which has a dozen studies in it. The relationships are accepted as causal. However, we are just talking about risk factors here. The reality is that there are no studies showing any unclogging of actual arteries on a low carb diet. However, if you're looking at a vegan diet, we do have studies like those by Esselstyn showing just that. And in terms of artery function, we have this meta-analysis showing that low carb diets impair artery function. And this next study takes it even further by looking into the arteries of people on a low carb diet. And it's very interesting because the initial intention of the study was not to do that. They were putting people on a more plant-based vegetarian, no meat diet. And some people went off about 10 people ended up going on a low carb diet. And so they ended up with a comparison between these two pretty opposite diets. And the result, the people who were on the more plant-based diet ended up with 20% less clogging at the end of the year. However, people who went on the low carb diet ended up with 40% more clogging of their arteries. And here's a graph of their arteries. Mr. Noakes, it is not looking good. But now let's move on to what appear to be some of his main motivators for advocating for this diet, which are losing weight and reversing type 2 diabetes like he did. And he will show you some dramatic before and after pictures, but the reality is that when you lower calories past a certain point, regardless of the diet, you can reverse type 2 diabetes and lose weight. It does not mean it's healthy. And from this very recent study with no apparent conflicts of interest, a low carb diet was not more effective for weight loss than a low fat diet. However, their low fat was about 30%. That's kind of in the realm of the average American. Still, there was no advantage in weight loss as that fat level increased. But the important point here is, and this is gonna sound extreme, I can find a study showing that a starvation diet reverses type two diabetes, and that a starvation diet is really good for weight loss, and those are studies, but that's not a good enough grounds to tell people to feed their infants a starvation diet to prevent obesity and diabetes. And we'll talk about the baby drama stuff in a bit, but this just goes to show that a couple good points from a diet does not mean that it's improving your health state. And there is nothing that emphasizes this point better than this meta-analysis of 17 studies of over a quarter million people. And it found that low carb diets increase all cause mortality by about 30%. That means that over the course of these studies, the people on low carb diets died at a 30% faster rate than people that weren't on a low carb diet. And there's no reason to believe that Tim Noakes' particular brand of low carb diet is an exception. He is still putting the same stuff on his plate that Atkins did decades ago. They also had another interesting finding, which was that low carb diets were associated with a 50% increased risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. However, that was just a few points shy of being statistically significant, so sort of doesn't count. They just didn't have enough data in that area. Now I wanna talk about vegan diets here just for a second because I could see how someone in the comments might flip around my point and say, hey, well, just because vegan diet is good in a couple areas doesn't mean it's actually healthier. Well, yeah, when we have an Adventist study showing that vegans have 78% lower risk of diabetes, that's great, but it is also corroborated by how we see a 15% lower mortality in these vegans as well. It's a better health state. And also wanna mention Tim Noakes is very anti-carb period. So how does he explain that vegans who eat more carbs on average than your average person end up with way lower diabetes rates? And of course the Okinawan population also traditionally ate 85% carbohydrates in the 40s, yet they were the longest living population on earth until they increased their saturated fat consumption. Explain this, Mr. Noakes. Now I'm not saying that refined sugar is healthy. I'm just saying there's no argument against whole plant carbs. All right, now let's move on to the controversy in his career, which has been going on for a little while. There was a pretty powerful statement put out by his colleagues at Cape Town University in South Africa. They said they had serious concern for Professor Timothy Noakes, a colleague respected for his research in sports science, is aggressively promoting this diet as a revolution, making outrageous unproven claims about disease prevention and maligning the integrity and credibility of peers who criticize his diet for being evidence deficient and not conforming to the tenets of good and responsible science. But it got really bad when, as I mentioned earlier, he tweeted at a woman recommending that she weans her baby off breast milk onto a low carb diet. The actual tweet read, baby doesn't eat the dairy and cauliflower, just a very healthy high fat breast milk. 
key is to wean baby on low carb, high fat. This did not go over well, and the president of the Association of Dietetics in South Africa then reported him to the Health Professions Council of South Africa, and there was a misconduct hearing. This is quite a drama train. They then accidentally released a press release saying he was guilty. They then withdrew that, and then the verdict was that he was not guilty. According to Noakes, the hearing concluded that, quote, there is no evidence that what I said was dangerous and there was no doctor-patient relationship. He goes on to say, you can't get away from that. The guidelines say you wean your child onto fish, meat, eggs, dairy, and vegetables, which is the low carbohydrate, high fat diet. What, those are the actual guidelines? Well, interestingly, the council went ahead and appealed its own ruling, and there is another hearing set for some time this year, which sparked a petition from two weeks ago, which actually corroborated those guidelines in South Africa, which indeed are from six months of age, give your baby meat, chicken, fish, or egg every day as often as possible. All right, little Charlie, it's been a whole two minutes. It's time for another serving of fried chicken. Here. Oh, and your heart disease medication. But I can't fit in my diaper anymore. You're killing me. I think whoever wrote those guidelines needs their own misconduct hearing because this is exactly the type of guideline that leads to children getting fatty streaks in the aorta by the age of six, as we see in the Western world. The petition goes on to cite some literature such as the PURE study, which I have a whole video on. I refer to it as the POOR study because what it really did was pick up on the difference between high income and low income health outcomes. Essentially, poor people cannot afford to eat a lot of saturated fat, cannot afford those animal products, and the disparity in mortality, for example, in countries like India that was included in the study can be three times as much death for the richest first lowest groups of people and they did not adjust accordingly. But just out of curiosity, what kind of foods is he telling these people to eat? What kind of foods is he eating while looking to his Twitter? Here is one of the two meals that he has posted in 43,000 tweets, and you can see it includes about four eggs and four or five strips of bacon and a measly amount of vegetables. Okay, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that those are medium eggs, not large eggs. We're looking at 650 milligrams of cholesterol in one sitting, which is over twice the daily recommended upper limit of 300 milligrams. And okay, maybe he's delusional about the connection between bacon fat and heart disease. Well, how does he explain away the cancer connection? Apparently he missed the memo, but you may be familiar with some famous articles like this one from the BBC. According to the WHO's report, quote, 50 grams of processed meat a day, less than two slices of bacon, increased the chance of developing colorectal cancer by 18%. That's just the vegetable industry talking though. No, he's eating twice that. I think we're kind of getting an idea of how those low carb diets increase all cause mortality. And it doesn't stop there, just from a few months back from this study that I have yet to mention, three or more slices of bacon a week, which is 0.42 slices of bacon per day, was associated with a 20% increased risk of breast cancer. It keeps going as this news article put it, quote, even women who ate less than the nine grams of carcinogenic meats a week were still at a 15% increase of getting breast cancer than those who didn't eat such meats. So just including it in your diet at all results in a 15% increased risk. And this isn't the cancer that processed meat is supposed to cause, yet this is the most common cancer for women. And yes, these are just associations, but the point is, it's not looking too good for the foods on his plate for the diet he recommends. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the nuances of the implications of those misconduct hearings that a tweet of some dietary advice can land you in that situation, call you to hearings. I do think that absolutely, if you're giving really bad dietary advice, there should be repercussions. However, it's the view of the large medical organization, the large nutrition organization or whatever that ultimately determines the result. For example, we had a proposal for a law in Italy somewhat recently to make it illegal to feed your children a vegan diet. Thankfully, the largest organization of nutritional professionals in the world right now, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, says that a appropriately planned vegan diet is suitable for all stages of life, but what if they didn't? Or what if the organization in your country doesn't? So we do have to ask the question, how bad should the recommendation be for there to be repercussions? I would say we could start at recommending that people feed their infants carcinogens. That's a good place. Finally, I wanna look at his views on archeology, span the human history that made it so ideal for us to be eating large quantities of meat and no carbohydrates. 
he actually goes as far as to call us an omnicarnivore. Who is an occasional omnivore to this animal who is an omnicarnivore. I want to draw your attention to this chart from his presentation. I call it the Pyramid of BS. Now the graphic does imply that we have been eating dairy for two to three million years, which is absolutely incorrect. We domesticated cows about 10,000 years ago, and I'll let that one slide. But he's really saying that we've been eating all this meat for two or three million years and virtually no carbs until just a few thousand years ago. I mean, here he is. And we have to remember that this is the diet we've been eating for two million years. And this is the diet that, if you're British, only for 2 million, 2,000 years have cereals and grains been in the British, uh, in, the, in North England. Yeah, Northern Europeans have only been eating carbs for like 2,000 years. That's why it's a fad diet, is what he's saying. And this is completely ridiculous because we went upward into Europe about 45,000 years ago and looking to studies like this one, it appears that we were eating grass seeds, aka grains, over 100,000 years ago. They found a large assemblage of starch, oh, that's a carb, granules, which were retrieved from the surfaces of these sites, again, 105,000 years ago. I also think it's funny that he's saying that we didn't really eat carbs until large scale agriculture or until agriculture fully went into effect. Like we didn't know that a seed grew into a plant and we didn't practice any amount of horticulture or gardening. Or how about this? We didn't even have to grow it. There's a thing called gathering. Kronk, no pick plant carb, low carb diet, low carb. No, and archaeologists' views on this are shifting from this study by Karen Hardy and her associates. Quote, Cooked starch, a source of preformed glucose, greatly increased energy availability to human tissues with high glucose demand, such as the brain, red blood cells, and developing fetus. And again, he's so convinced that our bodies are not meant to eat carbs. So I would love to see him answer the question, why is glucose our preferred source of fuel? You have to be starving yourself of glucose to go into ketosis and use fat as fuel. So what was evolution thinking? Finally, he promotes the idea of us becoming human through hunting, particularly persistent hunting where you're chasing an animal down, and that's why we're upright runners that sweat. Because we became long distance runners. So this change occurred as humans became the best midday persistent hunters. In my recent video I did in response to Seeker, I go in depth into my starch runner hypothesis, another explanation for why that happened. So in conclusion, low carb diets, whether it's called the Atkins diet, the Noakes diet, Banting, Keto, whatever it is, are associated with bad long-term health outcomes. There is a reason that Atkins did not live a long and healthy life. And now imagine this situation. There is a meta-analysis of 17 studies and a quarter million people showing that vegan diets increase all-cause mortality by 30%. We would never hear the end of it. We have studies showing the opposite, lower mortality, and we still get flack. Furthermore, no, saturated fat is not a health food and carbohydrates are not the devil. I wish I had eight hours to go into every single claim of his in intricate detail, but sadly I do not. Finally, I do have to mention that when you are eating these high animal fat diets, you are increasing your environmental footprint massively and you are also contributing to harming animals even more. So my message to Mr. Noakes would be don't get hung up on these individual small improvements seen in low carb diet studies when the reality is that the health state of people on low carb diet is worse. This diet, which is largely dominated by carcinogens as your plate shows, is associated with a detriment in arterial function and an increase in artery clogging and an increase in death rate. A vegan diet, of course, is the opposite. It's lower mortality, lower cancer risk, lower diabetes, basically a better health state. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to let me know down below what you thought about Mr. Noakes' claims, and feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.